And now it's time for our next panel, Building the Business Case for Diversity with three representatives from the top business schools in America. Dr. Stephanie Creary, Assistant Professor of Management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Brian Lowry, Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Stanford Graduate School of Business. And Dr. Robin Eli, Diane Dirge Wilson, Professor of Business Administration, Faculty Chair, Gender Initiative, Harvard Business School. Managing it will be our moderator, James Gutierrez, Chairman of the Board, Listo. Take it away, James. Great, good morning. Good morning, SPLG. Thanks everyone for participating. I can't tell you how proud I am to be part of our first ever summit on diversity at SVLG. Uh, I wanna say thanks to Ahmad and John for that great discussion and your passion and leadership on this important topic of diversity. John, as you say, it's time to make history and especially now in Silicon Valley. So to that end, I'm proud to introduce our first panel with our nation's leading academics on diversity in business. Let me turn to our panelists. Each of you have been involved in producing or analyzing the most topical data and studies on diversity in business. As executives in Silicon Valley, we know that diversity in our teams matter and, and matters very much, but there seems to be a growing debate among academics and the McKinsey's of the world on how to make the case for diversity and whether it's a business case, it's a moral case or otherwise. Dr. Creary, can you share your thoughts on this debate, on this topic, and specifically, how do you frame the case for diversity in business? Well, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you all, uh, calling you in from Philly. I think what I'll do is I'll just frame the debate for us a little bit more, and then I'll offer you just a slight uh, insights into my perspective on this topic. Um, and I think it's important to talk about how academics are talking about the, the case for diversity uh, relative to how uh, business or industry might be talking about the case for industry. So business, business tends to take a, a hard line stance and looking at does diversity actually create financial performance? Whereas in academia, we create much more subtle and more nuanced advanced uh, uh, debates and, and insights around does diversity, uh, what's the value of diversity broadly in groups and teams and organizations? How does it help our organizations to be more effective? And are there broader ways of thinking about diversity as being beneficial or value-based, uh, value-driven more, more uh, broadly? Um, so when we think about the way that industry often talks about the case, again, it's often as tied to hard financial metrics things that are about producing shareholder value. Um, it's just a note that many of these studies that uh, industry is putting out are showing correlations. It's not showing that, showing that diversity causes financial performance, but it's saying that there are some strong correlation or relationships between the composition of an organization and, and financial performance. One of the latest iterations of this has been the ESG, Environments, uh, Social and Governance Conversation, which has looked not just at uh, diversity is tied to producing financial or value for shareholders, but what are the risks to shareholder value when firms don't have diversity? And in this case, for many of the large asset managers, it's been about what are the risks to shareholder value when the board is not diverse? Now that's a very different conversation than academics are having about the links between diversity um, and performance more broadly. We've also uh, in more recent years have focused more on organizational effectiveness, things like productivity, so uh, a couple of scholars to be mindful of in their work in this area has been Quinetta Roberson at Michigan State University and her colleagues, where they've talked about one of the things that's been um, important to recognize is when we try to link uh, diversity to form performance in academia, we find a lot of mixed relationships. That means sometimes there's no effect and sometimes there's a positive effect. So we've been spending decades trying to figure out why might the effects be different? Is it something about the firms that they're more innovative firms are more likely to have stronger ties or is it something else? Um, and so her research has really been looking at trying to help us open up that black box and understand why the results are different. Another thing that I wanna point out to you is a study that was recently published by uh, Orlando Richard, who's a professor at UMass Amherst. And he looked at the effects of racial diversity congruence 
um, on firm productivity. And what that means is, is the diversity of the top management team relative to the diversity of, of lower managers, to what extent is having those, uh, th that, those characteristics align affect firm productivity. And so he's finding in, they, in their research, they find that when the top management team is diverse and when the management team, uh, lower management is diverse, that firm productivity is, is higher in these firms. And interestingly, he looked at corporate hardware and corporate software, um, computer software and computer uh, hardware organizations, um, and many of them in Silicon Valley. So that's Valley. So that's all to say that we're making different arguments. There is evidence to suggest correlations, not causations. In academia, we're much more concerned about the nuance and understanding. That all said, I'll just quickly give you my perspective on this. I, I do believe that this becomes a large distraction. I do believe that we do not have evidence to suggest that spending all of our time focusing on proving a business case is actually producing uh, outcomes and changing the nature of cultures and organizations. So if there's anything that I would hope can be gained from today's conversations and other conversations is that we begin to move beyond trying to prove there's a case to actually focusing on what we need to be doing differently. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Curry. Dr. Ellie, you've been working on this topic for years and years, and so I want to thank you for being here with us today and, and being one of the foremost leaders on this um, and this debate and this topic. How, how would you frame the case for diversity, and how do you respond to some of the things that Dr. Curry said? Yeah, so thanks so much, and, and I really appreciate being here, um, and it's really a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, Brian and Stephanie. Um, so I, I I do agree with um, with everything that Stephanie has said, and you know I I just I want to go back to the way you framed the question, which is you know this question about what is the case for diversity and whether it's a business case or a moral case, because I think that's a juxtaposition that a lot of people are making these days, and I, I just you know I want to say that I, I kind of prefer not to make that juxtaposition because the way I see it is that actually inequality is bad for business and society. I, I think that the two really go hand in hand. Um, you know, I mean, it stands to reason that companies are leaving value on the table when they recognize and develop the talents of only a narrow segment of their employee base or their potential employee base. And unfortunately, we have tons of evidence showing that that is precisely what most companies are doing, not intentionally necessarily, but because of the way their cultures operate. So white women and people of color tend to be on the short end of the stick when it comes to getting developmental opportunities, when it comes to getting high quality, actionable feedback, being given a second chance when they make a mistake or when they fail or having their talents even just recognized and rewarded, I could go on. But all to say that you, you really can't extract the benefits of diversity unless all employees are full participants in the enterprise. They need to be fully seen, they need to have a voice, they need to be recognized and engaged, and they need to be to, to be really, you know, rewarded accordingly. And trust me, any company that can do that well will have a spectacularly loyal workforce and an amazing competitive advantage over other companies because developing that kind of a culture, a culture that really supports all employees to thrive and to reach their full potential, that's not easy to do. And that's why it's also not easily imitated. So that's kind of one angle on, on the business case for diversity. Thank you very much. Dr. Lowry, well, first I want to say it's nice to be able to turn the tables a little from when I was a student <laughs> and you would cold call me and, and uh, now I've got one for you. So uh, great to have you here with us today. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, we, we've heard that there are some studies that show uh, no causation uh, impacting shareholder value. But as we talked yesterday, you, you kind of said that should not even be the question. So I want to ask you, you know, how do you respond to that? Uh, and how, how do you frame uh, the case for diversity? Um, and also, uh, maybe I read your Washington Post op-ed as well. Um, and how does this connect to racial justice? Uh, well, it's great to be here, and I'm happy to be on the other end, James. So, but don't worry, I, I'm still sure I can find a way to cold call you. I'll, I'll, I'll look at I'll look for that opportunity. Um, so, in terms of, let me just say I, I agree with um, Professor Query and um, um, Eli. I um, I think that the question around diversity is um, more complex than we make it out to be. I think the dichotomy is false, as Robin said. Um, 
I, th I think when you talk about diversity first, let's be clear, people, when they say diversity, what people really mean are people of color and women, right? So when you ask the question, what's the business case for diversity, let's translate that and be honest about what we're saying. Like, what's the business case to hire more people of color and women? Like, when you say it that way, that's a very different question, right? And people don't want to be honest about what they're, what they're saying when they ask the question. So I just want to be transparent from my perspective on what that question is. And so what if, the, what if the data show there is no direct financial benefit to hiring more people of color and women? Are we saying then that businesses aren't gonna hire, aren't gonna hire more people of color and women? Are we still gonna be comfortable in the Valley with the incredibly low levels of people of color in these large organizations? Is that, is that, is that really what we're talking about? So I, I just, it's just hard for me to understand that question when you frame it in a more transparent, I think, honest way. So that's one. In terms of if there is a business case, let's imagine there's data. And there are some data that show benefits of increased representation of people of color and women, for example, on boards and financial performance. Um, even if that case exists, it's quite possible that m engaging in um, hiring for those reasons are not likely to produce the benefits because the benefits don't come. It's not like magic. The benefits happen because of the way those people are treated. The benefits happen because of the internal procedures and practices of those organizations. It's not like you put a woman on the board and magically everything gets better. It's like you put a woman on the board or a person of color on the board and you listen to them. You treat them with respect and they add value because people who have talent add value. There's nothing special about, about that. But if you put someone on the board and expect their ethnic group membership or their gender to magically produce effects for you in terms of your bottom line, my guess is you're unlikely to see those effects. So I, I just have a problem with this, this conversation about a business case for diversity along a number of lines. And then even, and, then, and again, I'll just go back to the moral case, which is against this argument, which is, I don't know that I should have to, to defend my ability to perform in an organization by showing you data that if you hire me, your bottom line is going to be improved. Like that's just a strange way to set it up. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I did get to say what I wanted to say, which is always the value in being cold called. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, you know, you're keeping it real. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. Um, you know, you mentioned that we should be talking about policies and conditions. So let's, let's move there. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the conditions, policies, and procedures that work and or that need improvement uh, and also bring in the values of equity and inclusion. So um, Dr. Dr. Ellie, Dr. Lowry, as, as leaders design better companies, what are some tangible steps for harnessing the potential of diverse teams uh, of women and people of color and also for equity and inclusion in business? What new ideas should we be doing now? I'll let Robin Anyone? take this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, you know, I, I can share with you the way I work with companies that want to do better around diversity. And, um, you know, the first step, I think, is to really, for them to, de to, to develop an affirmative vision for their company, you know, a, a vision that really embraces the value of being able to attract and develop and retain a diverse workforce. Um, so they, you know, I guess what I'm saying is they really need to figure out what their what their business case is. They they need to be clear about that and they need to communicate it consistently. So I think I think every company needs to figure it out for themselves and you know, based on their values and their principles, how how do they intend to create value in the world? So um, I think the second thing, uh, and I'm and I I'm I'm not going to be offering up like you know specific. Uh, practices. I think it's something broader than that. I think that the, the second thing that they need to do is to really get up to speed on how their current structure and culture are, are operating in their organization. So their practices, their policies, their norms, who's interacting with whom, how do they identify and define talent. They need to, fig they need to look at how that might be inadvertently creating, you know, systematic, giving systematic advantage to some groups over others. And what that means is that they're going to have to let go of some of their sacred cows. So let go of conventional notions of what potential and talent look like, or of their belief that they know it when they see it, because that usually means they know talent that looks like them. Um, and then they need to link their selection and promotion criteria to bona fide task requirements, right, to the real requirements of the job. 
Um, because so often companies have these ideas about what it takes to be successful. And we heard about that, you know, in the first session, certain credentials that a person needs to have or certain schools they need to attend or certain kinds of experiences they need to have had in order to be successful. When in fact, those things are not always necessary to do the job well and holding onto those criteria systematically disadvantages the groups that are less likely to have had the opportunity to have done those things. And then I think it's about creating the conditions that enable success on those criteria, the ones that are actually relevant to the jobs that people are being hired to do. And that's a pretty tall order because it's really about building a culture that supports the development and contributions of a wider range of people. So, you know, I think that this is something that is idiosyncratic more or less to every company. It's like, how does your cult, how does your culture operate? It's different in, you know, company to company, industry to industry, and, you know, really getting clear about what's going on in your own company and, and, and assessing, you know, what do you need to do in order to create those conditions so that people can, can really thrive and reach their full potential. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Ely. Um, we've got, uh, we have such a short time and I want to cover a lot. So I'm going to jump to another topic. Um, let's bring it home for a second. In Silicon Valley, you know, there's a, there's kind of a prominent view here that we live in this perfect meritocracy and that success is color, gender, and, and all forms of diversity blind. Uh, is this right? You know, at, so at the SVLG, we've been historically as an organization focused on housing and transportation as some of our big issues. Uh, but now we're having our first conference on diversity and, and we're working on racial justice. So uh, maybe jumping back to you, uh, Dr. Lowry and also Dr. Puri, um, what have our leaders been missing in the past and, and why is this moment different? Um, well, first, I mean, I think it's transparently not a meritocracy. That, that's my view. I mean, and, and I just say that about America generally, like you think about how much money people expend on their kids to try to give them an advantage. Like, I, I just think it's, it's a fiction, right? And we all, we all know it's a fiction, but we choose to participate in, in it or not. I just, there's so much evidence that it's not just a pure meritocracy in this country or in, in any organization. Um, so that's first. And I think maybe what's different now or what I hope is different, we'll see, if we'll see, the future will tell, is a, a greater recognition that um, issues of racial justice are not the issues of just ethnic minorities, right? I mean, racial justice is um, an issue for everyone, right? So that, that includes um, white people too. Like in this country, the way race functions and in the valley, the way, the way race functions is it, it shifts the available opportunities for everyone in particular ways, right? And if you take that into account, if you really start not to think about diversity as um, people of color or to think about racial justice as a charity done for people of color and think of it as a moral obligation if we wanna live in a more just society, then I think that shifts how people behave. And I think in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, you see a, a, a much wider array of people out there um, calling for racial justice, which I'm, I'm just, I'll just say, I'm not the most hopeful person. I tend to be more on the pessimistic side, but to the extent that there's hope, I think that's, that's where hope comes from for me. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. Dr. Curry? Yeah, I'll just be brief and say that there's some great research done on this topic of meritocracy and how subjective of a notion this is by uh, Professor uh, Amelia Castilla out of MIT and Professor Aruna Ring-Nathan, who's at Stanford GSB, which says is we all interpret merit very differently. We have different definitions of what that means. So the whole notion of claiming a meritocracy in and of itself is subjective. That said, we know when people take this hard line stance of it should be a meritocracy, that should be the only thing that matters, is it effectively ends up hurting women and people of color. Why? Because we actually know, just as Dr. Lowry said, that relationships and advocacy really are the key to people's success. And the less that we're transparent about that, the more that we tend to ignore the fact that these aren't the things that women and people of color are getting. So our whole notion of being colorblind or genderblind in how we think about success is hurting people of color because we're not acknowledging that they're not getting the things that actually you need to be successful, relationships and advocacy that aren't accountable when we talk about meritocracy. Thank you so much. Listen, we have time for one last question. I just want to make this a lightning round, and this is a little bit self-serving in some ways to our organization. Uh, you are all the leaders on this field, and so we're 
uh, we're humbled to have you. Um, I'd like to ask you just if you can give us a quick answer on what advice would you have for us and our member uh, companies as we take on this topic of racial justice as an organization? So I'll go by just saying, I think it's important to focus on outcomes beyond shareholder value. I think it's important to focus on outcomes at the team level, at the employee level, because all of the interventions that companies are putting in place, whether it's mentoring programs, whether it's in, um, employee resource groups, whether it's you know unconscious bias training, they aren't designed to produce shareholder value. So if you keep on measuring that as linked to shareholder value, you're not gonna find any relationship, but you will find out how much that improves team culture and people's willingness to stay. So we need to be more focused on those more proximal outcomes as opposed to these financial performance metrics. Awesome, thank you so much. Dr. Lowry? Um, I think that there's a declining trust in capitalism in this country. Let, let's just start with that. If businesses want to continue to enjoy um, the kind of, um, I, I would call it deference that has, it's been given um, and continue to participate um, in a positive way in the societies in, that they benefit from engaging with, then they have to care about the health of the society and you cannot care about the health of the society and not care about justice. Thank you. And I'm being told we just have a few seconds, but Dr. Ely, we, you know, we'd love to hear from you briefly on this. Thank you. Yeah, just just really quickly. I mean, I'm, I'm reiterating what's already been said, but I, I, I would I would really wish for companies in Silicon Valley to um, that you see the value of investing in people in underrepresented groups because it honors our collective humanity. And it gives our lives meaning. So I don't know if this is so much advice. It is it is really my wish that if company profits come at the price of our humanity, then I think it's costing us too much. And at the end of the day, if in any given situation, there's a trade-off and there likely will be um, uh, at certain times, I, I would really wish for, um, you know, for the leaders in Silicon Valley to, to prioritize humanity. So that's my, my kind of my final plea, I guess. Thank you. Well, I, I want a virtual uh, applause. Thank you all. And, um, we appreciate your support of, of our event and our efforts and for all your uh, work in the academic field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This clip brought to you by the following sponsors. Thanks for watching. For more information and clips, go to svlg.org.